Here to you, I'm John Scott. And I'm Molly Lyon. Thrilled to be here with you today, John. Great to have you here, Molly. The uh, president just returned from his working vacation in Mar-a-Lago, where he spent the holidays with his family. And while he was there, anti-government protesters took to the streets in Iran with deadly results. The country's supreme leader, the Ayatollah Khomeini, blaming the unrest on, quote, the enemies of Iran. Well, President Trump says it's time for a change there. White House correspondent Kevin Cork is live with more. Uh, Kevin, what else is the president saying about those ongoing protests in Iran and just how that might affect uh, U.S. policy going forward? Well, great to have you with us, uh, Molly. We'll talk a bit about possible uh, policy shifts in just a bit. But first, I just want to say that the president's made very clear his belief that the people in Iran want freedom. And that is something that the leadership there, the mullahs and uh, control there, refuse simply to give them. And that is why you're seeing this protest play out. We've talked about this, you and I, over the great many years that we've done this. Uh, it's not just the Trump administration that made this observation, also the Obama administration and before that the Bush administration as well. Let me take you to Twitter. Uh, the president uh, making uh, his opinion known. Uh, as you just showed earlier today, the president was talking about this, and he did so yesterday as well. He said, look, Iran is failing at every level despite the terrible deal made with them by the Obama administration. Uh, the great Iranian people have been repressed for many years. They're hungry for food and freedom. Uh, along with human rights, the wealth of Iran is being looted. And he concludes by saying, time for change. Now that tweet comes amid demonstrations across the Islamic Republic and the deadly government crackdown there to silence dissent. But the president is also facing some strong words here at home, this time from a former Obama administration official, former UN Ambassador Susan Rice and National Security Advisor retweeting uh, a New York Times piece on Twitter about the uprising saying, how can Trump help Iran's protesters? Be quiet. Well, that drew this response from Kellyanne Conway. You don't be quiet when people are losing their lives because they're standing up for basic essential needs and for freedom. A couple people are starting to realize that if you're out of touch with major with Americans primary concerns, if you're not for the working people, if you're not for freedom around the globe, look how much safer and more prosperous we are as a nation just in this last year. This president stands with the Iranian people in their quest to get basic freedoms their quest to get basic freedoms. Now, in case you're wondering about possible policy shifts, uh, the truth is uh, Congress could certainly do something at the behest of the administration in terms of new sanctions. And as a White House official told me not long ago, all options remain on the table. Molly? Uh, what are the leaders in Iran saying about the president's response to the protests? Yeah, as usual, right? They're not going to basically accept responsibility for what's happening in their own country. Rather, they decide that they'd like to point the finger and outsiders take a listen the enemy is waiting for an opportunity for a crack through which it can infiltrate look at the recent day's incidents all of those who are at odds with the islamic republic have utilized various means including money weapons politics and intelligence apparatus to create problems for the islamic system the Islamic Republic and the Islamic Revolution. The death toll there continues to rise, unfortunately, now at 21 at last check. And I should also add that some 450 people have been arrested over the past three days, but the unrest is not subsiding, at least not yet, Molly. Kevin Cork at the White House. The world is watching. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And as Kevin just reported, the president is taking aim at the Iranian regime while deadly anti-government protests spread across that country. Mr. Trump also took time out to blame his predecessor for some of what's happening, tweeting, the people of Iran are finally acting against the brutal and corrupt Iranian regime. All of the money that opportunity as President Trump seems to to impose more sanctions, you need to find a way to make sure those sanctions hit the regime, not the people in the streets, the very people you want to support. So uh, this is tricky. I think what the administration is trying to do is two things. First, uh, think about imposing some additional economic sanctions on Iran, which they can do under existing authority to protest human rights violations, but also to work out an international response in which the U.S. and some of its European partners make a statement of support uh, for the people in the street, their right to be there to protest things that they uh, don't like about the economic and uh, political situation in Iran. Yeah, interesting. In 79, it was the students who helped to depose the Shah and ultimately set up the kind of government that they have now. Uh, it's the students who are back out in the streets this time protesting what they've got. 
Well, the students then are now the people in charge of the regime now. Yeah. So it's a it's a reversal. But, but again, this was true in 2006 and 2007. In particular, those were student led protests. And the Bush George W. Bush administration tried really hard to figure out then how can we support them in a way that might produce a change in, re, in the regime or the character of the regime, at least in Iran. Uh, and they couldn't figure out how to do it without uh, creating a backlash. And what happens in these situations in Iran, and it's happened repeatedly, is the hardliners in the regime use this kind of protest as an excuse, not just to say this is the West trying to undermine our revolution, but to crack down and to squeeze the moderates in the regime, to the extent there are any, off to the side and into the margins. And so what the hardliners can do in Iran, uh, and probably will in this case, is use this as an excuse to take over more power, not less. Yeah. There, there are some who suggest that this might be an opportunity uh, for the world, really, to renegotiate the Iran nuclear deal. Here's what Senator Lindsey Graham had to say over the weekend. If I were President Trump, I would uh, have a nationwide address pretty soon explaining uh, why the Iranian nuclear deal is a bad deal for the world, what a better deal would look like, and urge Congress and the European allies to get a better deal with Iran uh, before it's too late. Is this perhaps, Jerry, an opportunity to do something like that? Well, look, the, the Europeans' uh, interest, uh, the, our allies' interest, the other partners in this deal uh, interest in renegotiating is near zero. So I, I, I don't think that's going to happen. The U.S. could pull out of the deal entirely. That wouldn't, that wouldn't take it away. It would still be in place. It simply wouldn't include the U.S. as a partner. What could happen, and what I think the, in the first instance will be the attempt here, is to start some new negotiations with Iran over its missile program and its support for terrorism. And if the Iranians don't want to cooperate in that effort, then use that as an excuse to impose some more economic sanctions. And the Europeans might be willing to go along with that. But right now, the U.S. continues to stand alone on the idea that the a nuclear deal ought to be renegotiated. Those two, 2009 protests in Iran, um, you know, the feeling, in that country at least, was that the U.S. did almost nothing to help them. Would that be uh, the same case this time around, do you think? Well, I think already you see the rhetoric out of this administration is different uh, than it was in 2009 out of the Obama administration. You know, again, it's hard to know what is more helpful here. If you if you if you uh, express your support for the protesters in too uh, obvious a way and a too high a volume, you run the risk of undermining their legitimacy internally. And so, mm. uh, if you don't do that, you run the risk of being accused of standing by silently and not lending support. So it's hard to get this balance right. And as I said, I think repeatedly uh, administrations in Washington and haven't quite figured out how to do that. Three successive administrations yeah. have faced this issue, as you point out. Yep. Jerry Seib, Wall Street Journal. Good to have you on. Thank you. Thank you. And protests in the streets of Pakistan in reaction to President Trump's angry tweet about the country's, quote, lies and deceit. Trump is slamming the Islamic Republic for protecting terrorists while taking billions in U.S. aid. Our ambassador has been summoned to the capital city for an explanation of the president's comment. Benjamin Hall is live in London with more. Benjamin? Yeah, hi, Molly. The Trump administration has been talking about this issue for quite some time now. The fact that on one hand, Pakistan takes billions of dollars from the U.S., while on the other, seemingly supporting groups that the U.S. is fighting actively against in Afghanistan. Well, today there were mass protests across Pakistan in response to this threat to withdraw funding as Islamic groups held rallies in major Pakistani cities. Ironically, among them was one radical group connected to the Mumbai attack. Protesters chanted against the U.S. and President Trump and called for the U.S. ambassador to be expelled after President Trump tweeted this on Monday. The United States has foolishly given Pakistan more than $33 billion in aid over the last 15 years, and they have given us nothing but lies and deceit, thinking of our leaders as fools. They have given safe haven to the terrorists we hunt in Afghanistan with little help. No more. This pressure from the Trump administration began back in August when the U.S. said it would hold up $255 million to the Pakistani military until they cracked down on extremists. On Monday, the Trump administration said that was still the plan. The relationship between the two countries has been on a downward spiral ever since Osama bin Laden was killed in the Pakistani town of Abbottabad in 2011. The U.S. also tracked down and killed Taliban leader Mullah Mansour in the country in 2016. Now, yesterday, Pakistan did make one small change. They actually banned all donations to groups which were on the U.N. Security Council sanctions list. But other people feel that nothing will really change as long as Pakistan 
sees Afghanistan and the Taliban as useful allies, or at least a buffer zone against India. And of course, remember that Pakistan is a nuclear armed country, and for that reason needs to be uh, kept stable as can be. Molly? All right, guess to see how big the changes may or may not be. Benjamin Hall, thank you. Mm -hmm. It is the 2nd of January, 2018, and it is the day Senator Al Franken is set to step down. Why the embattled Minnesota senator is making good after announcing his resignation a month ago. Plus, President Trump returns to the White House energized after a year-end legislative victory on tax reform. He wants to hit the ground running in the new year, looking to make good on campaign promises. We'll have a look at his 2018 agenda ahead. The specific agenda items, and we certainly hope we will get Democratic support on them, include the budget, getting some reasonable budget caps, uh, and maybe a budget deal for the next two years, certainly. It includes welfare reform, the dignity of work. This is a president that's invested in all types of careers and is trying to tell Americans that we dignify every type of work. Senator Al Franken will officially step down from his seat in the Senate today, resigning almost a month after announcing his departure over allegations of sexual misconduct. More than half a dozen women allege the Minnesota Democrat in, uh, touched them improperly or made unwanted advances. Franken's successor, Minnesota Lieutenant Governor Tina Smith, she will be sworn in tomorrow. Right now, the holiday break is over for Congress as they head back to work this week. Republicans have a long to-do list before the midterm elections if they want to hold on to their majority on Capitol Hill. The Democrats will need to flip two seats in November to take over the Senate. I think you always have to go into an election year with an awareness, particularly when you have a majority and it's a midterm election in, in, in a presidential term, that the party that is uh, in power typically loses seats. But given that, I think the best way for us to overcome what might be uh, some of those historical um, you know, trends is for us to put up a record of accomplishment. And that's why passing tax reform, meaningful tax reform that's going to bring uh, you know, meaningful tax relief to hardworking Americans in this country, middle-income families, I think is going to be really uh, essential as people start to evaluate this president, uh, this Republican majority. But the most pressing item for now is a funding measure to avoid a government shutdown, which will need bipartisan support. Joining me now is the director of the Center for Politics at the University of Virginia, Larry Savado. Sir, thank you so much for joining us here today. We appreciate you're the perfect guy to dig into all of this as we head into 2018. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, and it's going to be a great New Year for political analysts because it's a national <laughs> election again. <laughs> right, it's like one big gift, right, as we head into the midterms. Uh, as we do head into the midterms, of course, there have been some predictions that this could be a blue wave year, uh, you know, similar to the, revol the Republican Revolution in 1994, but in reverse. Do you buy that? Do you think this is a year for a blue wave? Uh, it's way too soon to say. Uh, is this a year that is likely to favor Democrats? The answer is yes, because it's a midterm election year in a Republican administration and Republican Congress. Having said that, look, it's January 2nd. This is the day for flights of fancy by both parties. <laughs> uh, if you listen to the Democrats, there's going to be the biggest blue wave since the one that sunk the USS Poseidon. If you listen to the Republic, I know that was a movie, I should say that. <laughs> uh, the Republicans will tell you they'll, they maybe will lose two or three seats, but they can see taking this Democratic seat and that Democratic seat in the House and the Senate. All of it's justified on January 2nd. Mm -hmm. So we have to see what happens. I thought Senator Thune was right when he said one of the keys to this election year is whether Republicans are able to credibly link themselves uh, to the, the improving economy using the tax bill. Also, they need for President Trump to improve his ratings. He's got to get his job approval up. That will also help them, and it will keep the size of the wave down. So digging into that just a little bit more, many Republicans are claiming the big victory off the tax reform bill. Not every Republican voted for it. Uh, and meanwhile, the president also saying that this is a big victory. So as you mentioned, they do seem to see this as the seawall to stop the blue wave as they head into 2018. If, they, if the economy really does surge and we see improved jobs and the middle class really does see a little bit more money in their pockets, granted, we, they don't file their taxes until the following year, until post midterm. Uh, will that be enough? I mean, pocketbook issues consistently rate at the very top when voters head to the polls. 
Well, it's not going to be enough to save every endangered senator and House member, but it might well be enough to save some who are in very competitive races that could go either way. And, you know, for in, in the Senate, for example, let's not forget the map is incredibly favorable to the Republicans. Doesn't mean they'll be able to hold on to the Senate, but it sure means they'll have to lose a lot of races they ought to win to lose control of the Senate. The uh, improving economy uh, could help that, and they've got to use it well, and I'm sure they will. That's what they're going to be working on all year. Yeah, those red-leaning states may certainly help the GOP. Let's talk a little bit about what's on the legis what's coming up legislatively. In January alone, they got to get the funding bill, and it seems like immigration has been sucked into this. For just one example of a potential impasse, Democrats have said we're not signing unless we see some effect on the Dreamers. We want to help the Dreamers, and the president said, "Sure, you will get a DACA deal, but I want my wall among other measures related to immigration." Uh, do they get past that impasse, and where where do they compromise? On, all, and on so many issues heading forward into the midterms. If you're a friend of Senator McConnell or you're a friend of Speaker Ryan, send them a big package of migraine excedrin for the new year. Because in the Senate in particular, McConnell is going to have to get the votes of nine Democrats in addition to holding all 51 Republicans. See, we're past the 51 vote rule. Now it's 60 votes to pass these key items in the Senate. So either there's going to be some degree of bipartisanship or nothing major is going to be passed, including right in the beginning here uh, when a lot of deadlines are coming up very quickly. It isn't going to be easy. You, you look at the new senator from Alabama, Doug Jones, I think he would be a vote open to the Republicans on at least some things. The same with Senator Manchin. This is an election year for him. It's different than last year. Senator Heitkamp in North Dakota. Uh, Senator Joe Donnelly in Indiana, Senator McCaskill in Missouri. These are all Democrats, but they have to run in states that Trump carried handily uh, come November. So there are Democratic votes available to the Republicans. It's just tough to get up to nine. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see particularly what happens in Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, some of those uh, uh, states that are out yes. there will be really ones to watch. Uh, Larry Sabato, thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Have a great New Year. You too. Murders in Chicago actually down in 2017, but are the numbers anything to celebrate? A live report from one of the Windy City's most dangerous neighborhoods coming up. Plus thousands of travelers returning home from abroad held up at several U.S. airports for hours. The reason why, next. Please help me. I, we came off the flight. I'm coming from Grenada from a lovely dive trip, okay? And the kiosk is up there, shut down. Some frustrated overseas travelers returning home yesterday to long lines at passport control in several U.S. airports coast to coast. A computer issue at the Customs and Border Protection processors made for a pretty aggravating wait. Agents had to switch to a much slower backup system. The kiosk is up there, shut down. So they hoarded us all to this line, okay? And we're standing in line for an hour. People who just got off their flights, they open up the line, let them go to customs before us. We've been standing in line for over an hour. There are three hours with two small kids, and they having it. Uh, it's really embarrassed what is happening inside. Imagine that at the end of a long flight. Well, the outage lasted for two hours, but the holdup remained for much, much longer, causing many passengers to actually miss their connecting flights as well. That does not sound like fun. Well, Chicago police statistics show that city has seen a slight dip in the number of murders and shootings in 2017. The Windy City is seeing 650 murders last year compared to nearly 800 the year before. Matt Finn, live from Chicago, with more on all of that. Matt? Well, John, it's a sign of just how bad things are here in Chicago. That 650 murders last year is an improvement from 2016 when two people a day were killed in this city. Right now, we're on the city's south side in the neighborhood of Englewood, which is historically and statistically one of the most dangerous neighborhoods in all of Chicago. Many people would not walk alone here, especially at night. We caught up with one woman who lives here. She's a crime blogger to talk to her about what daily life is like here on the south side. 
sitting on the porch on Sunday morning, drinking coffee and seeing someone with a gun just shooting or sitting on the porch at night after work, listening to music and then hearing shots ring out, um, had a lot of anxiety. Now, neighbors like that woman could breathe a sigh of relief through police efforts. There's been a 43% drop in shootings here in this neighborhood in 2017. John. So is it what police are doing or, you know, what's the reason for the drop in crime? Well, there's a drop in murders and there's also a drop in shootings. There was about 2,700 shootings last year compared to 3,400 shootings in 2016. And police largely attribute that drop in shootings to this technology that I want to show you. It's called Shot Spotter, which is placed atop utility poles in the most dangerous neighborhoods in the community. It's basically a sonar and a camera that instantly detects gunshots and alerts police, rapidly improving response time and potentially potentially capturing these shooters on camera. The mayor also added 1,100 officers to the force this year and placed an emphasis on community policing. Here is that woman we just heard from talking about what these improvements mean in her neighborhood. They really have a connection with the community and community organizations. And they're, you know, they don't come around as security. They really come around as a fabric of Inglewood. And I think that has helped as well as the technology. Signs of improvement here in Chicago, but John, 650 people murdered last year in a 12-month period. So we still have a long way to go here in the Windy yeah. City. Back to you, New York. Hard to wrap your arms around those statistics. Matt Finn from Chicago. Matt, thank you. Well, it is a new year, which means there are some new laws taking effect. How one state is looking to cash in on the sale of recreational marijuana. Plus, President Trump back in the White House after the holiday break. Why he's already facing a very long list of challenges in 2018. With a new year comes new laws that are now in effect, like in California, where it is now legal to sell marijuana for recreational purposes. Just one of dozens of new state laws. Chief correspondent Jonathan Hunt is live in Los Angeles with more on that. Happy 2008, Jonathan. Um, what are some of the significant law changes? Uh, that are happening out there yeah, happy in particular. New year to you 2018, too, I should say. Well, I should bring it up into yeah, this decade. 2008. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not go back a decade, although I wouldn't right. mind. But anyway, listen, almost everyone could be affected by these laws in some way or another. And if you're a gun owner, a pot smoker, or a minimum wage worker, the changes will have a very significant effect. California, just the latest state to legalize recreational marijuana with business brisk yesterday at this Santa Ana store. While the long-term impact of the law is still hazy, growers are expecting an economic boom. The state will be making a lot of money by taxing sales heavily. And anyone over 21 can now light up, provided they don't do it while driving or riding in a car. Big changes, too, for gun owners here in California. California, They'll no longer be able to buy ammunition online and have it shipped to their home. And anyone convicted of a hate crime will be prohibited from possessing a gun for 10 years. And the minimum wage will also be going up here as well as in New York and several other states across the nation, Molly. What about some of the other interesting law changes across the country? Well, as well as that minimum wage change, New Yorkers are also going to get what Governor Cuomo calls the nation's most comprehensive family leave policy, eight weeks for most workers. Everybody should have the right to be there when their spouse is giving birth. Everybody should have the right to be there when their mother or father is sick and needs help. An interesting new law, too, in Tennessee, given the free speech debate on college campuses across the country in 2017, the state now saying colleges cannot exclude speakers based on opposition by others to what they might say. Finally, Illinois, in its infinite wisdom, Molly, has now decided that pets can be treated like children in divorce cases. So from today, family court judges in the land of Lincoln will have the added fun of deciding cat and canine and perhaps even cuttlefish custody. <laughs> Whatever pet you have, it's and now part of your they divorce. They have Good a luck truly difficult job. I will say that for sure. Uh, Jonathan, thank you so much. Jonathan, <laughs> it's just got a lot more difficult. Sure. <laughs> and hedgehogs. 
Don't forget the hedgehogs. President Trump back to work at the White House today. The to-do list for 2018 is a long one. So let's bring in our political panel today. Josh Holmes is former chief of staff to Senator Mitch McConnell and Jim Kessler, former legislative and policy director to Senator Charles Schumer. Jim, last I checked, 2018 was an election year. Typically, not a lot of business gets done in Washington during election years. So, you know, what chance do you give this president of, of getting anything on his to-do list accomplished? It is an election year. Look, he has a decent chance, but he needs a course correction. 2017, he was overtly partisan. He did very partisan things. Uh, as a result, he's got an approval rating that, you know, couldn't melt butter. And he has fewer legislative accomplishments than any president. You've got to go back to, like, William Henry Harrison. So if 2017 was about partisan activity, 2018 has got to be about bipartisan activity. And if that's the way he's thinking, I think he can get things done. Worth pointing out that he ended the year with an approval rating equal to Barack Obama's at the end of his first year, I believe it was. So Still doesn't melt butter. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I'll take that analogy. Uh, Josh, you know, the, things like infrastructure and, and Obamacare uh, reform are, are still supposedly tops on the president's agenda. What are the chances? Well, a couple of things that Jim said. For one, for Republicans and President Trump, 2017 it was an extraordinarily uh, action-packed, accomplishment-ridden year. Uh, I think the tax reform package for the first time in over three decades itself is an incredible accomplishment. So they in, they enter 2018 with a really strong hand and a lot of legislative momentum. Uh, the question is, in election year, it looks a little bit different. And one of the things is I think legislative accomplishments here are going to have to be in a bipartisan manner. I think they've got some opportunities there cool. with infrastructure and other items out there, but they're going to have to have Democrats play along. And up till this point, Democrats haven't been willing to do much of anything with the president or anybody else. But isn't that what the American people want, Jim, is, is bipartisan uh, cooperation in Washington? They do. And look, I think one of the reasons why Donald Trump was elected in the first place is they thought, well, maybe he would he would do that. And in the opening months before he took office, but between his election and the inauguration, he was showing some signs. And then he just made the foolish mistake of doing repeal and replace. It wasted eight months. It set the stage for a very partisan year. He's got opportunities to do something that is bipartisan. It means that he's got to give a little bit. I think a perfect place to start is with DACA, with the immigration. He said on September 5th in a tweet, we're going to solve this with heart and compassion. We need to see if his words are worth, you know, the tweet that it was written on. But that would be a place where you could do something, convince Democrats that he actually cares about something that they care about. And then from there, get other bipartisan deals. You got to have some sympathy, I suppose, Josh, for Mitch McConnell. He had a tough enough job when the Senate was a 52-48 split. Now, with the uh, arrival of Doug Jones as a Democrat from Alabama, it's 51-49. <laughs> you know, some have suggested that Jones might actually want to vote with Republicans on some issues because he comes from a very conservative state. But if he if he does that, isn't he going to find himself alone at the Democratic lunch table? Well, I mean, if he has any interest in remaining a senator, he certainly would vote with Republicans. Alabama is not interested in the kind of liberal Democratic uh, leadership that Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi and others in the Democratic uh, conferences have provided. The question is, you know, how much crossover? Clearly, there's a, a thinner Republican majority. There has to be some crossover voting. The one thing to keep an eye on, there are an awful lot of Democrats in very red states that are up for re-election in the United States Senate. You're talking about senators like Claire McCaskill, Heidi Heitkamp, Joe Manchin. There's a laundry list, at least 12 in states that President Trump carried, some by double digits. They're going to have to look very closely about whether these uh, priorities align with their political interests in 2018. All right. Real quick prediction from each of you. Out of those areas we've talked about, health care, welfare reform, Form, immigration, infrastructure. Where do you think this country can make progress in 2018? Jim? Well, welfare reform, definitely not. I mean, that's a non-starter. Entitlement reform, that's something that Paul Ryan wants to do, but Mitch McConnell doesn't want to do. I think infrastructure is a possibility, immigration, and I also think uh, some of the small fixes to health care that uh, Senator Murray and Senator Alexander were talking about could, ha could help. All right, Josh? 
Yeah, no, infrastructure clearly is an opportunity where, where both parties can meet. On the immigration front, what's interesting about that, everybody talks about DACA. Clearly, Democrats want to do DACA. The question is, what have they been willing to give to do it up till now? Absolutely nothing. Nothing to do with chain migration. Absolutely nothing to mm. do with the wall. They're going to have to move off of those uh, points of view in order to move anything substantial on immigration. And we've got a, a, a budget uh, issue coming up. We're going to have to get the government funded later in January. So we've always got the threat of another shutdown coming. Won't That'll this be, fun. be a fun year? <laughs> Guys, thanks for helping us kick it off. Jim Kessler, Josh Holmes. Thank you both. Thank you. Thanks, John. President Trump taking on the deadly protests, sweeping Iran, taking a different approach from his predecessor by choosing to side with activists. Our next guest weighing in on his strategy. Now to our breaking story in Iran, where a crackdown on protests against the Iranian regime has now killed at least 21 people. Meanwhile, President Trump expressing his support for activists while condemning the approach taken by his predecessor, Barack Obama. Our next guest commenting in a Washington Post op-ed, quote, It should thus come as little surprise that President Trump, fresh off repudiating Obama's nuclear deal with Iran, has taken the opposite tack and thrown his weight behind the protesters. But the Trump administration faces the conundrum that has long stymied U.S. officials seeking to support dissidents abroad. What precisely can we do beyond issuing statements? The author of that article joins me now. Michael Singh is a former senior director of Middle Eastern Affairs at the National Security Council and managing director of the Washington Institute. Michael, thanks for joining us today. Am I? I want to turn to the piece you've written, but first I want to get your reaction to this. This morning on Fox and Friends, Kellyanne Conway, of course, counselor to the current president, criticized something that Susan Rice had put out. Susan Rice, of course, both the national security advisor and for a U.N. ambassador under the former administration, uh, President Barack Obama. Rice tweeted, how can President Trump help Iran's protesters be quiet? And she shared a link to a New York Times piece that argues we can, fair we can be fairly certain that high profile public support from the United States government will do more harm than good. What do you think about that comment? Well, you know, I think that the Iranian regime is going to blame us uh, for these protests uh, and try to cast the protesters as foreign agents, regardless of what we say. Uh, in fact, the Supreme Leader of Iran has just done that today. And so there's no real advantage, I think, in staying silent. Um, at the same time, you know, the uh, words alone aren't really going to accomplish much. Um, it's also important to bear in mind, Molly, that the president's statements aren't just directed at Iran, not just at the protesters in the Iranian regime, but they're also directed at his own government that, you know, hey, we should be doing things to support the protesters, as well as at U.S. allies around the world who hopefully will uh, feel like they need to issue some statements of their own, which they haven't yet. And, Michael, I want to turn to your piece. Uh, you, beyond statements from the White House, tweets expressing support, what can the U.S. do? What concrete actions can America take? Well, I think, you know, international pressure is better than U.S. pressure alone. And so organizing our allies to jointly make statements in support of the protesters and even more importantly, jointly warn the Iranian regime against the mass use of violence against these protesters, warn them that there will be consequences for any crackdown. Um, that's really the first thing. Uh, the second thing, you know, Molly, is, look, these protesters, dissidents inside Iran, obviously don't face an environment where they're free to express themselves free to organize. And so we should be using uh, the platforms that we have to keep attention on them, to give them chances to speak out, to provide accurate information to people in Iran about what's happening, um, but also maybe the tools to evade some of that censorship and surveillance. Will this be different from 2009? It's a very dangerous place to be a political dissident. Tens of thousands taking to the street. We know that uh, more than a dozen have already been killed thus far. Will things be different? It's, it's hard to say, of course, it's tough to predict what direction this is going to go in. I think that what we can say is, you know, we, we tend to look at this, we tend to pay attention to this episodically. We pay attention to 2009, we look at what's happening today. In fact, I think we need to take the long view. This is a long sort of simmering resentment we see in Iran. Uh, and eventually, one has to think it will produce some kind of change in Iran. Um, and we don't know when that will take place, but we want to make sure that we're ready when it does take place. And we want to make sure we do what we can to encourage Iranians to make the right choices, to, to sort of step back from some of their more repressive, uh, aggressive policies and, and take more peaceful paths. 
Your piece concludes with this. Western officials should also keep their expectations of the protests in check. They could gather steam or they could subside. The sign of a successful policy response will be its ability to survive either, event either eventuality. Based on the premise that an Iran that is more responsive to the needs of its people will be less dangerous to its region and to the United States. How does the U.S. walk that line? Well, look, I, th 